Uh, people talk about the power of prayer. I want to address that a little bit because a friend of mine and I were talking the other day, and you know, everybody has their little pet peeves about stuff. And, and he was like, I hate when people say the power of prayer, like prayer in and of itself can do anything. And it's like he, he says, because people lose the perspective. It's not prayer in and of itself. It's who you're praying to. That's where the power resides, not in the prayer, but in who you're praying to. And I think, by and large, most people when they talk about that, we get what they mean. They're talking about God. They're not talking about just because they've prayed the prayer that there's power in it. But sometimes you do get that, that lazy fallback thing that we say. My th thoughts and prayers, thoughts and prayers, thoughts and prayers. And while we want that to be a reality, I think, again, people need to know that when we're praying, we're not just, you know, remembering you, we're thinking of you. We are praying to the king of the universe, the king of all, for your help, for your redemption, for your healing, for your safety, all those things. So uh, power of prayer is a little misguided sometimes the way we use it, but it's God who has the power, and we are appealing to him for his power and for his intervention and for his love and his will and all those things to be done and that we learn as we go. Uh, the other thing is, is that as we go down some of these points today, I'm going to have you know, some little comments about each of these things. And it will be a bit repetitive, but folks, listen, I want a lot of this stuff to be burned into our memories. Because part of what our mission here is, part of what my mission has always been, is thinking about three verses in particular. Jude, where we are to earnestly contend for the faith. We are to earnestly contend for the faith. In 1 Peter 3.15, always be ready to give an answer for the hope that is in you. Apologia. That's where we get the word apologetics, to defend the faith. But do it with gentleness and respect and glorify Christ. And then in 2 Corinthians 10, we are to take a hold of these strongholds, these lofty ideals that are raised up against the knowledge of God and take them captive for Christ. So as we go down this list here, and we think of some of these things, I think it's good that we have a response, not only for ourselves, if nothing else. Maybe it's just for ourselves. Maybe we see something on television, we hear something, we read something in Scripture, we read something somewhere else, and we get a little, a little uncomfortable with it. We get a little blown back by it. Well, this is why this repetition is a good thing as we go down the list because you go, boom, yeah, I, I, I know what this is. I know what this is. And then you simply, with prayer and the knowledge that God has given you, you deal with it. You could be talking to newer believers who have questions. You could be talking to seekers. Even if they give you a hard time or they, they're, they're snide in their responses to you, that, that's okay because they may really be seeking for an answer. And folks, if we don't give it to them, you know, who will, right? So that's part of why you'll hear me repeat some of these things from time to time, because I think that they're good verses, good ideas that will be good for us and good for other people. And sometimes you just get into one of those situations where somebody is nasty and, you know, you feel the need to respond. And that's okay, too. That's part of it. That's part of it. So, okay. So with that said, we go back to the Lord's Prayer. And the Lord's Prayer is, like I said last week, is a beautiful prayer in and of itself. But if you look at each verse in that prayer, there's a particular theme in each of the verses. And so there's so many things that we pray for that fit beautifully in each of those verses. So let me just get, give you an idea of what we're talking about. Uh, you can go to probably Luke 5 or Matthew 6, but it starts off how? Our Father. Our Father. Folks, do you realize that non-believers, not, not that they'd pray at all, but uh, the reason we're able to say to God, Father, our Father, is because we're saved. Because we're we belong to Jesus. Jesus refers to God as the Father, and we can too because of Christ. That's a privilege. That's an unbelievable 
profound privilege to be able to pray our Father, our Father. And so just doing that, the worship that we, that we give to the Lord when we say our Father. Um, and we talked about that last week, how you know, the, the worship follows along you know, all these different lines of the worship and then the adoration of God, uh, thanksgiving, confession, submission, commitment to future obedience, intercession and supplication, and then finally the petitions and requests like we're doing here. So that's how it starts off. But, uh, but then we go to the next verse. Our Father who art in heaven, okay, hallowed or holy be your name. Holy be your name. Every time I say that prayer or I read it in the Bible, I can't help but be still really frosted about what the message Bible, quote unquote, did to the Lord's Prayer. Uh, let me just, I, I just, I, I copied and pasted this. Let me just read what, what the message says. Father, reveal who you are. Set the world right. <laughs> Keep us alive with three square meals. Keep us forgiven with you and forgiving others. Keep us safe from ourselves and the devil. Did you see what was omitted there? Hallowed be thy name. Holy is your name, Lord. That was deleted from that book, from that paraphrase that passes itself off as a Bible. And I've said this before, and I want to hit this point again hard, too. Either Eugene Peterson was the greatest Greek scholar in the history of the world, and everybody up until him got it wrong, or he's wrong, and he's dead wrong. And the same thing would hold with the Mormons and the Jehovah's Witnesses, who... They, especially the Jehovah's Witnesses, with that group of people they had to uh, get, come up with their New World translation. Again, either they're the greatest scholars in the world, and everybody else for centuries got it wrong, and we should now look to them. But that still doesn't quite work, does it? And you want to know why? Because then the character of God comes into question. Well, wait a minute, Lord. You've said for centuries... All along, all throughout the world, all these different people revered Jesus Christ as God. Not just a God, but God. That holy is your name. And now, for all these years, for all these centuries, all over the world, Lord God, you let that go and everybody bought into it and it was wrong? So folks, this is another thing we always have to come back to, and that is the power and the sovereignty of the living God. We have got to just accept that, embrace it, and understand that God's character trumps everything else. It trumps everything else. And so even though I know that Eugene Peterson just completely botched this, and maybe he did it on purpose. I don't know. I don't want to get into motives or anything like that. But the Message Bible is a travesty of a translation. It's a paraphrase, and it's not a good one. Okay, that's the first thing. Um, but, um, and I don't trust the Jehovah's Witnesses team who had no experience in biblical Greek. That was another sham. But what trumps all of it is God's character. And the same thing with Joseph Smith. And um, the God and Jesus appearing to him. I always come back to this one thing. So wait a minute. Joseph Smith, you're saying that the Bible that we had for all these centuries got corrupted, it's wrong, and now you've got to come in and set the record straight. God told you, no, you've got to change this. You've got to add this. What was God doing for all those centuries? Just letting people get the wrong information and going, oh, well. And then, how do we know if that got corrupted, that this new thing you're coming up with, how do we know that's not corrupted by now? But here's the answer, because we don't trust you. I don't trust the uh, people translating the Bible. I trust the Lord, and I trust that he's got control of it. He can control it. He can make things happen. And he doesn't need any help from us, okay? So I think I just wanted to get that on the table because that's something that's always kind of bothered me. 
But um, our Father, who art in heaven, holy is your name. And then I love this too. Thy kingdom come. Thy kingdom come. Folks, you remember in Titus 2.11 through 13, for the grace of God has appeared bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. We are to be looking for the return of Christ. We are to be awaiting the raptura, the harpazo, or as we call it, the rapture. That's what we are to be waiting for as a church. Now, the second coming of Christ could probably just as easily fit into that for the people who you know, are not saved at the time that the rapture happens. And I'm not going to get into all the debate about that right now. But the point is, thy kingdom come, the kingdom of God coming to earth. And we know that at the second coming, the messianic kingdom will be established. God's kingdom will be established on earth for a thousand years. But that is another thing that, that in our prayers, and it fits perfectly in with the Lord's prayer, thy kingdom come. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. Amen. Then the next thing is um, to pray for people in general. Uh, 1 Timothy 2, 1 through 2, and also for rulers now. First of all, then I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. So we do that, folks. We pray for the unsaved. We pray for people in general, people we don't know. That's part of what we do here. It's part of what we do individually. It's very biblical. And Paul susses that out right there. He gives it to us plain. Here's another thing. And and again, we just just prayed for this, and I think we pray for it... um, every Sunday, but that is the salvation of Israel, the salvation of Israel. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they be secure who love you. That's Psalm 122. And on your walls, O Jerusalem, I have set watchmen all the day, all the night. They shall never be silent. You who put the Lord in remembrance, take no rest and give him no rest until he establishes Jerusalem and makes it a praise in the earth. That's still yet on the horizon. And we, that's why we pray for the peace of Jerusalem. But the Lord's Prayer, our Father, we talked about that, who, are, who art in heaven, holy is your name, your kingdom come, and then your will be done, Lord. Your will be done. Well, what's, Lord, what's the Lord's will? Well, there's a lot of things, you know, salvation and obedience and, uh, uh, you know, redemption and uh, reconciliation and all these different things that God has, that, that he wills. And um, so that's part of what all this is about, too, is God's will, and that can cover so many different areas. So that's part of what the Lord's Prayer is. Um, And then we say, give us this day our daily bread. Well, what does that mean? Well, that's personal needs. Personal needs. Uh, Lead us and, and forgive us our sins and our debts as we forgive those who are indebted to us. So you've got confession and forgiveness that we're giving before the Lord and then uh, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. So we're praying for spiritual victory there, right? Spiritual victory. But again, each of those things has a beautiful place just with, its, just with this, the, 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 the prayer itself. The whole prayer and each individual line of the prayer. But then when we think about what you can be plugged back into each of those Verses is really amazing, and that's kind of gets into the next part of this, which is the specifics, the specifics of prayer. Now, we did, I kind of jumped out of order a little bit, to be honest. Uh, so we did, um, you know, people and rulers, we just did that. We did the salvation of, of, of Israel. Uh, then we pray for, you know, 
uh, all kinds of believers. You know, we pray for uh, newer believers and backslidden believers and uh, pe- just believers in general, right? For uh, people in general, the salvation of Israel. Uh, our enemies and our persecutors, we're to pray for them too. But I say unto you which hear, love your enemies, do good to them which hate you, bless them that curse you, and pray for them which dis- despitefully use you. Now, I want to make a quick touch on this because we've talked about persecution before. Beloved, why are Christians persecuted? Why? Yeah, well, sure, I mean, that's part of it, but I mean, then you have to ask the broader question, what about the religion of Christianity is there persecution for? Christians pose no economic threat, they pose no political threat, they pose no physical threat. So why do people in these other countries, why are they so deeply persecuted where they will kill you for proclaiming the name of Jesus or for going to church? Why do they do it? Because, folks, this is so directly satanic. You are over the target as a believer in Jesus Christ. And when that persecution comes, it is because the people that Satan has his tentacles wrapped around, they want to destroy those who God loves. That's what he wants to do. That's his only game. And so that's why this persecution happens, because this truth that we possess as Christians, Jesus Christ in us, our belief, our salvation, our eternal life. This isn't just our religion, guys. This isn't just our thing that we go along and say, okay, this is our little thing and whatever. No, this is the truth. And it's the truth for us, it's the truth for everybody. And is it because I'm saying it, because I'm, you know, I'm the guy doing the message, or because I heard Billy Graham say it, or the Pope? No, it's because God said it. And this is why we go back to what I mentioned before, is that we trust the character of God, that He is the one who communicates. He is the one who sets the table. He is the one who offers salvation. It's not my job to figure out how to get saved and say, okay, I got my thing. No, God sets the table. God is the one who establishes it, and he's the one who's communicated it, and we can count on it because we can count on him. That's what this is all about. That's what it's all about. And so the persecution comes because that truth is so real, and it's so evident, and it's so painfully obvious that this persecution occurs for one reason and one reason only is because it is so directly satanic and we are over the target because we possess the truth. And that's all I have to say about that. So we pray, like I say, for the saints. Uh, Ephesians 6.18, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. Yeah, we pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ. All of us here, the ones who aren't here, the people throughout the country, throughout the world, the ones that are being persecuted, the ones who are maybe just now hearing the gospel for the first time. And by the way, folks, we know we're all saints. No, we're not angels, but we're all saints. You know, we didn't have to do anything to earn sainthood. So St. Daniel or St. Jean, no, no, we're all saints. Why? Because of Jesus Christ, because we are brought into that family and we have become saints because of him. So we pray for, you know, all the different brothers and sisters in Christ we have. Uh, We pray for people who are in the ministry and people who go out and are missionaries. Uh, And also for me that these words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. And then in Colossians 4, 3, at the same time, pray also for us that God may open a door to us for the word to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I am in prison, that I may make it clear which is how I ought to speak. So folks, you got people that leave the safety and country, the safety and and security of, of this country to go to places that, you know, a lot of people just don't want to go. And uh, it's a calling. It really is. And it's an amazing calling. 
And we want to pray for all those people who are in that position because they are giving love, they are giving teaching, they are giving comfort, they are giving the greatest truth of all time. They are looking at people. And folks, I don't care how rich you are, how poor you are, I don't care what your, 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 your status in life is. When it comes to that time that you're going to draw your last breath, everybody's on an equal playing field. And we're on an equal playing field now because that death sentence is there. You know, unless the rapture comes, you know, no one's getting out of here alive, as they say. Okay, so that makes us all equal across the board. And so what happens after that is eternal life. Is it a real thing? Yes. Are heaven and hell real places? Yes. And the question is, do you want to let God tell you how you get to heaven and eternal bliss and joy? Or do you want to roll the dice and say, nah, I got this. I got it covered. I'll figure it out. And if there is a God, well, you know, I guess I'll deal with that at the time. The people to go out, and so what I, I guess what I'm getting at is, you imagine these children who are in such dire straits, such desperate situations. Can you imagine telling them, kids, look, do you realize that God exists? Do you realize there's a creator and that there's a reason for all this misery? There's a reason for a lot of this stuff, but here's the deal. God loves you so much he sent his only son and that there is a time coming of perfection and it's real and it's true. Folks, what greater hope is there than giving that truth? And again, not doing it in a phony, offhanded way, but doing it in a way that is sincere and honest and intelligent. Kids aren't stupid. I know some of the shows that are on for them are really stupid. It seems like that dumbs them down. But kids are not stupid. They can receive this information, and you tell them that truth. Wow. What a difference that can make in people's lives. That encouragement, that truth that they carry with them. I remember, you know, when we did that uh, memorial service for this girl. She was a young kid but she died of, died of a drug overdose. And it was terrible what the track that her life took. Okay? But she came to Awana. She got saved. She didn't lose her salvation. She was saved. She made a lot of bad decisions in this ugly, stinking world with Satan pulling the strings and people going along with him, helping to corrupt and deceive while they're also being deceived by Satan. And I believe that girl's in heaven now because she was saved. And she had a miserable life here. And again, you know, those people who make so many bad decisions and get caught up in things that goes off the rails. But my point is, is that you ain't gonna get, you're not going to get that kind of hope anywhere else but in the reality and truth of God, His precious Son, and His plan. And there's plenty of people out there, folks, people doing it in churches here, out in the mission field or wherever, and we need to be praying for them, for their strength, for their well-being, for their financial security, and for their success, and that all the people that hear them will have open hearts and open ears. We pray for the laborers, Matthew 9 says that, Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he send forth laborers into his harvest. And that's part and parcel of the missionary and evangelistic duties we're called to. To fellowship with specific saints. Romans 1, uh, 1 Thessalonians 3. Now, when, uh, Randy and Christine are doing that now. They wanted to go out to uh, Colorado to see Wendell and Lois. Cool, man, that's great. They were wanting to fellowship with specific saints. That's awesome. That's part of all this. But we pray for our children, right? We do that all the time, our children and grandchildren. David prayed for Solomon. There's all these basic things that we pray for, again, that you will find in Scripture, that you will find elucidated by directive from God or example from the actual people 
in the Bible. So keep that in mind. But we pray for things like wisdom. And then there's suffering, there's sickness, there's crisis. There's all these things going on. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. And is any among, is any among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. James 5, 13 to 16. I was involved with that one time, and it was a blessing to be a part of it. It was an amazing thing. It just, I, I, that's one of those times where you feel an amazing presence of God, and that's one of the times I felt it for sure. And so, so for the sickness and the suffering and all these things, folks, yes, people prayed like that in the Bible. They tell us to pray when we're in that situation. What did Kathy say just a minute ago? Wanted to pray for herself. Is that a problem? No way. 2 Corinthians 12. So to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelation, revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. Should we be praying for ourselves and the things that go on with us? Absolutely. Absolutely. We're told to, and we have an example of the Apostle Paul doing that very thing. We're to pray for Jews in the diaspora, Jeremiah 29. But seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile, and pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare you will find welfare. This is when God says, I will bless those who bless thee and curse those who curse thee. People who have supported Israel will be blessed. People who have cursed Israel will be in bad shape. We've seen example of example after example of that all throughout history. And uh, folks, I'm not going to you know, sugarcoat it. I think one of the reasons that we've enjoyed the protection and safety we have in this country is because we have supported Israel. Uh, it's the right thing to do for a number of different reasons, not the least of which is that the Lord God tells us to do it. As we get to the last part of the Lord's Prayer, where Jesus says, you know, when we pray, say to deliver us from evil. Lead us not into temptation and deliver us from evil. Folks, I think we know what, uh, you know, so much of the evil is, right? It's obvious stuff like sin and temptation. We see the things that go on in the world that are really bad. But you know those things I just mentioned before? Suffering, sickness, poverty, natural disasters. All of those things. You know what, folks? That's evil too. Because it stems from evil. It stems from an evil rebellion. It stems from the evil that came into the world when sin entered the world and corrupted things. So when we're talking about being delivered from evil, yeah, we want to be delivered from Satan and everything that he has cooked up to derail us, to distract us, to discourage us. We want to be protected from that. We want to be delivered from that. And you know what? Ultimately, we will because we're going to be in heaven. You know, there's no more tears, no more pain, no more sorrow. We'll be in heaven. So we know that the final deliverance from evil is that, okay? But folks, even now, when we look at the church and we see some of the things the church is doing where they have abandoned the Bible, they have embraced worldly things, they have embraced sexual immorality, they have embraced abortion, and it's discouraging. It hurts to see that, does it not? When we see people that have this drug addiction or alcoholism, the godlessness that takes place, the making fun of Christians and things like that, it hurts. It hurts and it's evil when we see the encouragement of sexual immorality. It hurts because it's evil when we see cries and uh, 
and, and encouragement for children to have these they're being hacked. I don't even want to call it surgery. It's not surgery. You have surgery to heal. You have surgery to get fixed. These surgeries aren't that. They're not surgeries. They're butchery. Pure and simple. And it's an evil that's being embraced. It's an evil that's being pushed. And I come back to this all the time. I'll say it again. Children, uh, should they be able to buy a gun? Oh, of course not. Shouldn't be able to buy a gun. Can they buy alcohol? No, of course not. How about drive a car? No, no, of course not. Too young. How about to vote? No, 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 no. But you know enough that if you're a little boy and you think you're a little girl, yeah. Hack me up. Give me drugs. Only so a few years later I will regret it. And then watch that devastation. Folks, this is a grip of evil that I don't think we have ever seen. And when the Lord says we should pray to deliver us from evil, yeah, talk about the things that are in our own lives, our own temptations, our own sin, but also all of these general things that it's like, you know, I've said, I can't wait till one day we don't have to make these prayers. Lord, please heal this person who's dying. Lord, please you know, heal this one, heal that one. There'll be no need. <laughs> Praise be to God for that. But I want to touch on one last thing and close with this as far as evil goes, and that's this whole thing of abortion. And what, what, the reason that that's kind of come up again is because one of the things I've noticed with people even who were pro-life is that they've softened. Even the people who were pro-life have softened a little bit where they're talking about it more in the abstract. They're talking about it more in terms of uh, politics and you know, laws and states' rights and you know, federally and all these things. And they've taken the focus off of the fact that this is a life in a womb. That's where the focus needs to be. If you're pro-life, you should be unashamedly hitting that target and trying to tell the truth that that is a life in the womb. That's a life in the womb that you are killing. You can't sugarcoat it anymore. And like I say, and by the way, folks, when that, all these things are embraced as a nation, when we call evil good and good evil, and we embrace all these things, I don't care who your president is. I don't care who gets elected. We could have Abraham Lincoln come back from the dead to be the president. It's not going to matter if abortion on demand is embraced and codified along with all the other stuff. It isn't going to matter who the president is. And so I would encourage that if there's politicians out there who are truly pro-life, you stand up for life. You don't go out there and just try to make a political circus of it and try to obfuscate what's really going on so that you don't make the pro-choice people too mad. No, you tell the truth. That's a life in the womb. That's a life in the womb that you are snuffing out and you have no right to do it. I don't care if it's your body or not because that baby has a body too. It has its own DNA. It has a heartbeat and a brain and nerves. can feel pain. Everything else, you have no right. It's an abomination and it's something that we can't sugarcoat anymore. We want to be delivered from evil as the Lord has told us and we pray for that and this is one of the things and just to put the biblical finality to this. Jeremiah 1.5, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. What does that tell you right there? Is a life at conception? Biblically speaking, it's even before conception, but we can't do anything about that. So, but at least at conception, this is a life based on what the Bible's teaching. Now, I know a lot of people don't believe the Bible. Okay, I know that people, if they're running this country, that they're not Bible believers, they're not going to look to this and go, oh, this changes my mind unless they get saved. But what I'm talking about here, folks, I'm talking about Christians. I'm talking about churches. I'm talking about pro-life advocates who ignore these scriptures. 
Proverbs 6, there are six things the Lord hates, seven that are an abomination to him. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood. Hands that shed innocent blood. Is there any more innocent blood than a baby, a defenseless baby in the womb? Is there any more innocent blood than that? How, how could there be? I mean, yes, sin enters the world, and we come in with that as part and parcel of everything. But it's a baby who hasn't done anything yet. The most defenseless, the most innocent. And God hates those who shed that innocent blood. Praise God, He is a forgiving God, and many people have turned away and been saved. Abortionists and people who've had abortions. But then Psalm 139. For you formed my inward parts, you knitted me together in my mother's womb. <laughs> I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well, and indeed we do. Folks, it's like anything else. You've got to bury the truth. Like Romans says, people suppress the truth of God and unrighteousness. You know why? Because the truth is ever-present. It's there. We know it. People know instinctively that that is a life in that womb, but they do everything they can to try to change the rules, to try to make it sound softer than it really is. So we go from pro-abortion to pro-choice, and then we go to pro-women's reproductive health. And then it's anti-choice. And then it's government-induced or government-enforced pregnancies. What sophistry, what evil. That is also evil. That act itself and then all of the shameless sophistry that goes on behind all these things, not just abortion, but all of these things that are so obviously, self-evidently evil. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them. The days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. Folks, I didn't mean for this to kind of take this sharp turn away from prayer and into that. But like I said, all of the different things that we pray for, the general prayer of the Lord's Prayer, and then all the specifics can be basically fit into each of those verses. The worship, the adoration of the Lord, the uh, desire for His return, the confession, the forgiveness, and being delivered from evil personally and as a culture, as, 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 a, as a nation. But folks, we know that ultimately it's only going to be when you believe, when you trust the Lord and believe Him. Believe God. Don't make up your own rules about it. Believe God. Honestly seek to understand who He is and the love that he has, but also understand that God is not to be mocked, that God is a judging God, and he is a God of wrath. And he would rather people be saved, he would rather they repent, and all come to a knowledge of the truth. But these things, God will not let go and simply wink at that or look at it through his eyes. He will judge it. And so... Uh, the Lord's Prayer is not only a comforting prayer, but it is a prayer that we should understand is a, uh, a warning, a, 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 a cautionary prayer that, look, there's a lot of things on the horizon. Get it settled and come to know God and trust in Jesus Christ, His Son. Let's stand.